Hi. In this video, I'm really going to focus on a couple of things that we want to try and avoid, if you like, when we're doing our keyboard harmony. But I don't want to be heavy about this because I think the most important thing is to get playing. And if you are kind of breaking some rules, it's not the end of the world. But it's a good thing just to kind of know about these things. And then at some point you can kind of process them and, and see if you can work it into what you're doing. And all of these come with a kind of health warning. The, the rules, it's not like some kind of sort of something set in stone really. The rules are there just to help us end up with keyboard harmony that's maybe going to flow a bit better than otherwise it might. But sometimes by breaking the rules, you end up doing something really effective. So it's just a kind of need to know basis at the moment. And you might bear it in mind or you might think, you know, I've got too much on just trying to make this happen. So I'll come back to these later or never bother with them. Absolutely fine. But it's just something that might help some of your thinking. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is this business about doubling notes that we talked about fairly near the beginning of this course, because we said, didn't we, that each of these triads has got three notes. And if you want to turn your chord into four parts, five parts, six parts or whatever, then the way to do that is to double up notes. We've already said if you only want to work in two parts, usually the note you want to lose is the fifth. Not always, depends on context, but often that's the way. If you want to have more than three parts, fine, double up the notes. Now, there's a little rule, if you like, that says which, whichever chords you're using and whichever notes you decide to miss out ultimately, the note that's really wanting to be there is the third. So this middle note of the chord, the third, is one we want to try and include. But the third's a slight nuisance in that there's a rule that says you can double a minor third, but try to avoid doubling a major third. Now that is a bit of a pig, isn't it really? So in other words, chords two, three, and six are minor chords. So if I'm using chord two and I have F more than once in the chord, that's what I've got there, F there, F there, that's okay because it's a minor third. So I could do the G could come more than once in chord three or the E minor chord. The C could come more than once in chord six or the A minor chord, that's fine. But if I'm dealing with chords one, four and five, the C, F, G chords, then I'm advised not to have the third coming twice. So let's take chord four. Well, the A, the middle note of chord four, is a major third above the bottom note. Okay, and that's the one they're saying best not to do that twice. So let's take a chord four and let's break the rule. So we've got two A's. So can you hear what I've got there? I've got two A's, one there, one there. Now, does that sound like a serious problem? In many ways it doesn't, does it? On the other hand, that major third starts to dominate the chord a little bit. If I change that, in the left hand, maybe that A I moved up to a C. Can you hear that actually is a slight improvement, isn't it? So I've now got one A, one major third, and instead of having another one down here, I've moved this note up to here. So here's the double major third. Here's taking the double major third out. And the chord does sound a bit more kind of rounded, balanced, whichever way you want to look at it. You may or may not think that's a big deal. And there are plenty of great composers working in loads of different kind of musical areas who double major thirds for a living, basically. So who's to say you can't do it? We're not really saying you can't do it. All I'm saying is there's a little bit of advice out there saying maybe doubling major thirds isn't always the best option. So if you have a major third in the chord and you've got an option not to use it more than once, well, is probably a better thing to do. And by the way, that particular piece of thinking, that particular rule, if you like, is something that really applies when you're in four parts. The more parts you've got, the less it matters, to be honest. If you've got five parts, six parts, more than that, well, doubling up a major third is probably something you might end up doing. And it's not really a problem because the chords are thick enough to absorb the double major third. So 
there's a relatively small rule just to think about. Now, let me talk about another one, which is maybe slightly more significant. There's a little rule that says, try to avoid consecutive octaves or consecutive fifths. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, consecutive meaning two next door to each other. So, for example, I, I should have sketched this out before, but let's just give an example of how to break the rule. <laughs> and then we can see why we might try and avoid it. Say I'm in C major and I'm going to start with a chord one with C at the top, C at the bottom, and maybe I go on to a chord two. So I'm going to have D at the top in this case, and I'm gonna double up this D at the bottom, okay? And then I suppose we better fill in the middle parts. Let's fill them in like this. I could make this into minims as we've done in previous examples. Okay. So what have I got there? I've got chord one followed by chord two. There's one, there's two. Does that sound bad if I put them together? Sounds okay, doesn't it, really? But there's a piece of thinking that says, try to avoid this. The melody is going C to D, the bass is going C to D. And that's what we call consecutive octaves what I'm abbreviating as C8, consecutive octaves. In other words, I've got a C at the top and the bottom, and I'm going to D at the top and the bottom. So even though they're two octaves apart, it's something to do with octaves, isn't it? They're moving from two Cs to two Ds. And it's, the thinking is that if you've got any pair of parts, not just the top and the bottom, but could be other pairs of parts, that are an octave apart, and then both parts move to another octave, that this consecutive octave writing is not usually the best solution. And it can make the music sound like we've got one chord and the whole lot's just gone and we're all moving in the same direction, and maybe that's not the best way to do it. Is it serious? Well, that's for you to decide, but you know, that's the rule. Now, we've also got here, I've built in an example of consecutive fifths. So if I look at C, D in the bass, then I look at G, A in the alto part, that is consecutive fifths. What do I mean? Well, I've got C here and G there, and they're both moving up. So I've got D in the bass and A in the alto part. This is a fifth, and this is a fifth. Furthermore, they're not any old fifths, they're what we call perfect fifths. So if you know about your intervals, you'll know what I mean by a perfect fifth. If you're not sure about intervals, we have, believe it or not, courses out there that will tell you about them and intervals are pretty important to know about actually. Um, so you could have a look on our grade five theory course, for example, and learn about intervals. Also lots of other things on that grade five theory course that would just make sure you're happy about nuts and bolts of music if that's a bit vague. Anyway, that's a perfect fifth, C to G maybe an octave and a fifth, but that's still the same thing, then it's another perfect fifth from D to A. You can sort of hear that sounds a bit strange. So you've got octaves and you've got fifths. Put it all together and these chords moving in the same direction maybe is not the best solution. Okay, well, what can I do about that if I wanted to change it? Well, say I've got the same pair of notes, C to D, and I want to get rid of my consecutive octaves. Well, what it's really telling me is it's quite difficult to go from one to two, isn't it? Because if the bass goes one to two, and actually the soprano, the melody is also going one to two, then I'm stuck with these octaves, aren't I? Well, I am, unless I make a different chord decision. So, if I'm saying that D's in my melody, D is in chord two, but remember, it's gonna be in two other chords as well. Well, D's in chord seven, but we've already said we're not gonna to bother too much with chord seven at the moment, so let's forget about that. But D is also in chord five, so maybe if I want to keep C, D in my melody, I could actually go one to five. 
Oh, how about that possibility? So I could in the bass, for example, go C to G. That will give me one to five. And then if I fill in the middle part, so let's just see how this, I'll start with the same thing that we had here. And then let's just consider where it might go from there. Well, I could have a B there. I could have a G here. And do you see what's happened? I've got rid of the consecutive octaves between the top and the bottom. And I've also got rid of the consecutive fifths, haven't I? So they're not there anymore, are they? So that's sort of quite useful. So how does it sound now? Here was the one to two with the consecutives in it. Here's the one to five. Now the thinking is, that one to five is going to be stronger there than one to two, simply because of the consecutive fifths and consecutive octaves. Now again, is that such a big deal? Well, I don't think it is particularly, but probably avoiding consecutives is going to be a better thing to do. How do you avoid consecutives? Well, it's bad enough when you're writing down harmony, but at least when you're writing it down, you've got time to think, you can rub things out, have another go. When you're actually playing keyboard harmony, well, it's happening here and now, isn't it? So how do you avoid getting these consecutives? Well, one thing you might just want to try and think about is when you're moving from one chord to another, one note to another, try to get a sense of contrary motion between the top and the bottom. In other words, if the right hand's going up, can the left hand go down and vice versa? You can't always achieve that. But even if the two hands are moving in the same direction, try not to get them to move in the same direction by the same interval. So for example, if the top part's just going up a note, but the bottom part goes up a fifth, that's probably gonna be okay. It's less likely to chuck up consecutives. But if you've got a situation where the hands are just going like this in the same direction, chances are your keyboard harmony will be full of consecutive octaves and consecutive fifths. So if you end up slipping a consecutive in somewhere, well, you know, you'll live. And that's the great thing about doing keyboard harmony instead of brain surgery, you know? If you make a mistake, it's not terminal. So um, if you get some consecutives, don't lose any sleep over it, but that's how you might actually try and solve them. Bit of contramotion, or if we're going in the same direction, have the top and the bottom move by different intervals, chances are you'll be rid of your consecutives. So now what we're starting to do is to think about Okay, we can do chords, we can do cadences, we can do some chord progressions, we can do a little bit of improvising a melody, sticking a cadence on the end of it. Now, when we're thinking about our chord progressions, can we think about what's happening with those major thirds, trying to avoid doubling them, particularly in four parts. But the main thing really is to try and flush out as many of these consecutives as we can to end up with a result that's more satisfying. And that in itself is something that will affect the decisions we make about which chord. So you might be thinking all this time, well, if I've got D, how do I know if it's called two or called five or called seven? You might have thought, well, you've already told me to try and avoid chord seven for the time being. So is it two or five? How do I know? Well, just in this situation, one to two is feasible, but one to five works better because there are no consecutives. So it's one of the things that can help inform our chord decisions. So, a couple of things there to live with. Um, in a way, nothing new on the keyboard harmony, but a way of refining it. And you may want to pursue what we were doing in the previous session, and now check it out and think, well, have I got double major thirds here? Have I got consecutives? Can I try these little techniques to avoid them? Does it sound better? Do I need to change a chord? If I change the chord, does that sound better? Would it have been better if I changed the other chord? So, you know, experiment with it and see if it leads you to a stronger place because usually it will.